Let's get right to it. Pope Francis faced some difficulties during his apostolic visit to Chile over the clergy abuse crisis there this week. The Pope's appointment of an allegedly complicit bishop and his comment that victims need to provide proof of the bishop's involvement caused anger among some of the faithful. Some protests that turned violent with heckling during papal events and the firebombing of three churches ensued. The Pope later apologized, in part, on the papal plane returning to Rome on Sunday. He said that he realized it was a slap in the face to abuse victims for he to insist that they needed to show proof of abuse. However, the Pope continued to defend Chilean Bishop Juan Barros, who is accused by victims of covering up for the country's most notorious abuser of minors, a Father Fernando Caradima. The Pope repeated that anyone who makes such accusations without providing evidence is guilty of slander. This week, in his message for the World Day of Social Communications, Pope Francis condemned the propagation of fake news, and he insisted instead on a journalism of peace. Journalism, he said, should pursue an education for truth rather than use falsehoods or rhetorical slogans and sensational headlines to suit partisan purposes. Vatican spokesman Greg Burke further explains. I mean, the Pope is actually calling on journalists people working in communications um, to reach higher, basically. You know, he says it's very easy that we descend into division and into hatred, and that's, you know, a lot of false news is, is that. It's, it's, it's denigrating others. Francis also noted that fake news has been with us since the beginning of time when Eve was tempted to take an apple from the Garden of Eden based on disinformation from the serpent. And according to reports out of China, the Vatican has asked two underground bishops to step down, to be replaced by bishops who are officially recognized by the communist regime. According to Asia News, the Vatican has asked a Vatican-approved bishop to retire in order to allow a state-sanctioned, excommunicated bishop to take his place. Another bishop who was secretly ordained under Pope Benedict in 2006 has been asked to become a co-adjutor bishop of his own diocese so that a government-approved bishop can take his place immediately. The Vatican's requests are part of a purported plan, a deal with China, in which both sides would mutually recognize several underground bishops and state-sanctioned bishops. Meanwhile, the Vatican prefect for clergy is calling on the church to consider ordaining older married men to the priesthood in order to serve isolated Catholic communities. Cardinal Beniamino Stella made the comment in an interview released Monday in Italy. The issue is expected to come up during the 2019 Synod of Bishops related to the Church's pastoral work in the Amazon. Cardinal Stella said, an attentive study and a widespread ecclesial discernment are necessary before moving in that direction. His comments are similar to those made by Pope Francis in an interview last year, when he said the idea of ordaining virtuous older men must be considered. Cardinal Stella headed off some of the most obvious objections, namely that this will not mean a change to the usual requirements of the Latin Rite ordinations, and, quote, in no way would lead to optional celibacy. Here with his analysis of these stories and more is the editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org and one-third of the Papal Posse, Robert Royal. Robert, thank you for Great. being here, Great. as always. Okay, I want to jump right in to this uh, statement the Pope issued on World Communications Day. He says, I'm going to quote this, the theme of this statement is, the truth will set you free. And he takes on fake news. He makes a big deal of that. Some are seeing this as a jab at the President of the United States. Is it? Well, there's not a lot of jabbing in this. I, I think that there's a lot of, you know, general good feeling, goodwill, the way he couches these things. They're very, very general terms. Yeah. But I, I think actually what was going on here is there was an attempt to, in a way, co-op this term mm -hmm. that Trump has made very popular now. And over in Rome, they pay a lot of attention to what, what goes the United on States in the United says. States. Yeah. So I think that what he tried to do is say, yes, it is true that a lot of falsity gets transmitted by these powerful means of communications that now exist in the world, mm -hmm. and that we should all be alert to it, which, of course, is a very 
wise thing to yeah, say. Yeah, and it's, smart it's, marketing, it's, too. It's, it's a good thing to do. I have to say, this maybe is a little bit cynical. I don't think if that had been in there, there would have been much interest in this document. So it, it may have been a very clever kind of PR marketing hook tool to, yeah. to, to put that in. No, to mention the fake news thing kind right. of captures the zeitgeist. And a lot of journalists saw it and tweeted it out and, and reported it because of that. In the message, the Pope says, we'll put this up on the screen, regarding fake news, while advocating a, jur a journalism of peace, he said, even a seemingly slight distortion of the truth can have dangerous effects. Your thoughts on that in light of what we've seen over the last few years with Amoris Letiti and so much controversy roiling and confusion in the church? Yeah. Well, as you know, Raymond, part of my life when I am not doing journalism is I'm kind of in an academic mode and mm -hmm. I'm feeling a little philosophical today. Okay. So let me point out that Aristotle was the oh. one who said that small errors in the beginning can lead to large consequences mm. in the end. So the Pope is being very Aristotelian when he, he says this. Yeah, the, it, I suppose if you just took this, I'm, I'm joking about yeah. all that naturally, but, but if you just took this at a kind of a superficial level, it's true, but, but news is not exactly philosophy and it's yeah. not exactly science. News is mm. a kind of an ongoing sifting to see what is true and what is, is not true. So. It's good to warn people that yeah. false facts, mm -hmm. omitted facts, uh, analyses that are tendentious and right. whatnot, we all have to become very much mm -hmm. more aware of how much of this is actually going on in the world daily. And we're also inundated not, not only by uh, the, the old means of communication, newspapers, right. TV, radio, et cetera, but, but all the these... Endless the, social the, media. The social uh, media thing. I mean, yeah. as someone who runs a, a daily online site, I've got to say, I wish people would pay more careful attention because we pay a lot of careful attention to what we actually write mm -hmm. there, every mm -hmm. word. But it, this flow is just so overwhelming that we've got to be, all of us have got to be much discerning. More, more discerning. Which the Pope calls yeah. for in the document. And I, and I also think when you're dealing with so much information, it's so important to choose reliable sources to your eyes and over a period of time and go back to those sources. You know, I try to read five papers a day and then I'm following the Twitter feed, I'm following everything coming in. But that helps align things, put it in some historical context and even, you can even track the reporting of certain people. And let's face it, some reporters are better than others. That's just what it is. Yeah. I want to go back to this message and put this up on the full screen. The Pope makes a reaction that has been, or writes a statement here that has been getting a lot of reaction. He writes, an impeccable argument can rest on undeniable facts, but if it is used to hurt another and to discredit that person in the eyes of others, however correct it may appear, it is not truthful. We can recognize the truth of statements from their fruits. Now, this sounds like kind of situational ethics. You know, if, if I offend you with what I say, somehow that makes it less truthful. Well, there are a lot of exposés and a lot of reporters who have written exposés that may have brought people down to public disgrace because of the actions, thinking of Harvey Weinstein and others, uh, even some cardinals I could mention, uh, where it was used to discredit somebody, but it was true. Look, uh, we, we understand what he means there. The, the, I don't. We should, well, I think what he means is we, we should be reporting, we should be investigating out of a sense of goodwill. Mm-hmm. It's a very broad point, obviously, but I, I think it's worth saying that yeah. that's defensible. Yeah, that there are some people who are the, just hatefully the, reporting. Right. The, the problem, I think, with the, the way of couching that is that unless there is some pretty sharp examination of people in the public eye, and if you're going to be a public figure, mm -hmm. it's almost inevitable that, that news people are going to come after you. They're going to want to know why you did something. Right. You know, what about this consequence? You were involved with that person. Mm -hmm. And if they don't do that, if they don't raise those questions, they're not doing their jobs. I agree. Because we know that human nature has fallen. That's the basic, mm -hmm. that's the baseline that all human beings, in fact, America is founded on the idea that the founders in the, in the uh, Federalist Papers say, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Men are not angels. Mm -hmm. We aren't devils either, but we are not angels. And so there needs to be a very careful examination of all people in, in public uh, uh, life who have an, an effect on all of us. And mm -hmm. those consequences can be quite massive if the press is not doing its job. Well, but, but I think it is problematic to say that no matter how undeniable the facts, if they're used to discredit someone, that somehow they're not truthful. That's... 
th th there's something there that doesn't add up. I mean, Jesus Christ went out, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were there, he called them whitewashed sepulchers and brood of vipers. I doubt if he meant that to lift them up and make them feel good. He probably offended and discredited all of them. But it was truthful. Yeah, but I, see, I think about this as someone who lives here in Washington and reads the Washington Post, for example, okay. every day. We just had the pro-life march last week. All right. And the pro-life march was covered, as it often is, in the metro section, as if mm. it was a, a local very, event, yeah. you know, rather than a, a national movement, and at the very end of the last page of the metro section. So the truth was told there. But it was told in a way that was not really conveying what the, tr the fullness of the truth is. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a way, there's a, a phrase to tell the truth truthfully. And, and if mm -hmm. that's what he's trying to get at, I mean, I take your point mm -hmm. about how, how it can appear that even just stating the truth is not really the truth. But yeah. so much of these... People took umbrage with it because of that. I mean, I had everyone from novelists to journalists to our viewers. When I put this line up on Twitter, it exploded. It exploded, and much of it was negative, because th th somehow that didn't add up. That if you, if if the facts as you report them are hurtful towards someone, then that makes them less truthful. There's something, certainly as a journalist, you just go, no, 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 no. I mean, I may know something about a Vatican bank official who maybe was copying funds from an account. Well, if I know about that and I report it. Or if I know about a Vatican official engaging in drug-fueled parties at a Vatican residence and I report that, well, that ultimately becomes a disinfectant and a cause of good. It's not less truthful because it hurts somebody. No, no, I, agree, I agree with you entirely in, in, in that sense. Yeah, if we don't hold people accountable, there's no accountability. I, I think the problem here is he's, he's mixing religious categories and... and um, public journalistic categories, mm -hmm. which are going to be very, very different because, as I was saying earlier, the, the public, the, the role of the public journalist is to expose right. everything that's out there and then let this be sorted out by the five different papers that you read or sure. the different and the analyses. Public. That, the public that, will, that I also think the public has a, has a pretty refined um, detection of error and fake news. I think they feel it, they right. get it. Yeah. It takes them a little time, but they figure it out. Now, I, I think you're always better when you trust your audience and report to them on a level that is not condescending or somehow treating them like children. They can take it all. They can really, they can figure it out, and they will. I've seen it over 20-something years. I want to show you another line here that I, that I thought the Pope really nailed something and exposed something important in the media. He said, and really the Catholic media, he concludes by inviting everyone to promote a journalism of peace, and he, he, he said this, the saccharine kind of journalism should be avoided that refuses to acknowledge the existence of serious problems and smacks of sentimentalism. A journalism created by people for people, one that is at the service of all, especially those, and they are the majority of our world, who have no voice. This, I think, is a really important statement because so much, not only the Catholic media, but the secular media, they love to focus on the Pope kissed a baby. Oh, the Pope wore a funny hat in Peru. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry, that sentimental, saccharine kind of journalism. That is not journalism. People want to know how this faith is lived and the impact of the Pope's words on not only his own communion of faith, but far beyond it. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And and what Catholic journalists need to do is they need to go outside mm. the categories that the secular world is setting for us. I'm going to go back to the pro-life mm. movement. Mm. Last Sunday, four or five days ago, there were 40,000 people who showed up in Paris for their Marche pour la Vie. I saw that. Uh, has that been reported in, Almost in, nowhere. in, in English language uh, sources, even Catholic uh, sources? Almost nowhere. No, I saw it on the BBC in a right. little squib. Right. So what you pay attention to and the context that these things get put into. We, we heard all over the place that this woman's march after one year took place, and, and it was being replicated all over the country and, in fact, all over the world. And much of the, the rest of the story, the, the kind of, if you want to talk about the, the most voiceless of the voiceless, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the unborn child. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we can talk about the poor in, the, in various undeveloped countries and even within, you know, the, the yeah. wealthier countries, and that's an important part, part of this as well. But I, I think that the, the Catholic journalist has a special responsibility to find a, a different paradigm, to use a word that's very popular in right. these mm. days, and not be led around by the nose just wherever the, you know, wherever, mm -hmm. wherever the eagles are all gathering. And, and mm -hmm. journalists tend to operate in a pack, as you know, in yes. the secular world. They all yes. report on the same stories. They get the same press releases. Right. And, and their, their point of view is, is very, 
you know, myopic. Myopic, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk for a second about at the end of this, the Pope rewrites St. Francis's prayer and he puts a media spin on it, which I kind of found fun. Well, and, and I should also mention, when he talks about you have to be a voice for those who have no voice, that is really, was the guiding, I think, star for Mother Angelica. Mm -hmm. It's the reason she founded this network. She wanted it to be that voice for people who had no voice. And I know at times she got under some people's skin. They were not happy with the truth she told. But one of my favorite lines is, those who love you tell you the truth. Those who love themselves tell you what they want to, what you want to hear. Right. And I think that that's true. That remains See, true. What I worry about in, in that remark is mm -hmm. that we've had an awful lot over the years, Marxists, socialists, and whatnot, yeah. claiming to speak for the voiceless, for the right. excluded, you know, for the marginalized. Mm -hmm. And I always call this a bit of ventriloquism, actually. It's, mm. it's first world elites pretending that, you know, what the, the third world wants or the mm. developing world wants is what they say, right. you know, this inter sort of international ethic that, that, that exists. Mm -hmm. It's not. Mm -hmm. Not any more than, you know, mom and pop down in Louisiana right. really believe what the journalists on CNN in Washington, D.C. are saying on any given evening. Mm. I, I want to read, read through very quickly this, uh, this little bit here, where the Pope says, where there is shouting, let me practice listening. Where there is confusion, let me inspire harmony. Where there's ambiguity, let me bring clarity. Where there's exclusion, let me bring solidarity. Where there's sensationalism, let us use sobriety. Where there is superficiality, let us raise real questions. And he goes on and on. Where there's hostility, let us bring respect, falsehood, truth. The, the one missing ingredient here, I think, is, and, and it's, it, it is not addressed here, when you're in a global media apparatus owned by increasingly a handful of conglomerates with a motive of profit as its end, that becomes increasingly difficult to do because of the speed with which you have to change stories. Look, we have 15 minutes to talk here, 20 minutes or an hour. If you're at a secular network, you're lucky if you get three minutes. Right. That's a big segment. Right. Because the attention span of the audience is short and they are catering to advertisers. That changes the nature of journalism. It is, it really is just a come on for the next advertisement. That's what you're doing there. Here it's different. We're here to serve you because you, you've, you're supporting us. That's the different model. And in some, I think that's why this is so important. What PBS does is so important. You need to have those, those entities that are supported by people so they're getting more time and the stories they want to hear. I think even the print media, though, is, is doing the same thing. I mean, there, there, there's a tendency to want to shout so that people pay attention. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take the example again of our hometown newspaper here, the Washington Post, which has adopted this very funny oh, yeah. uh, saying in, in the era of Trump, you know, democracy dies in dies darkness. Dies in darkness. Well, it might also die if you, if you light bonfires all over the place, which is what they, they do. The front mm -hmm. page is, is every day is the latest outrage. And if they don't do that, I think they think they will not draw a, a readership. Mm. It's a very serious problem. So, look, th this statement, quite apart mm -hmm. from the fake news element of it, is it's a little bit anodyne. It's very general. It's feel good, you know, let's all promote peace and harmony rather than conflict. Mm -hmm. But in the political world, conflict actually can help because mm -hmm. it keeps one side or the other from becoming too dominant. And since, mm -hmm. as George Washington said, politics is not philosophy, the, w the way we kind of get a rough approximation of truth in politics, yeah. uh, other than on those moral points yeah. like marriage, you know, right, right to life, etc., mm -hmm. the way we get at the truth is by the, the ebb and flow of different points of yeah. view. Well, I love that he gave us a chance to talk about this and, and, you know, share some opinions and thoughts on the media because I think it's helpful for people to put it in some context. Let's talk about a big story. When the Pope was in Chile, um, there were protesters who approached him about this Bishop Juan Barros, who is accused of protecting um, negligent clergy who assaulted children. Um, the Pope rushed to this bishop's defense saying, there, without evidence of truth, it's calumny. No, there's no reason for me to discipline him or do anything. I'm paraphrasing. Your thoughts on the way this played out in his approach. Cardinal O'Malley eventually, I, I think it's fair to say, reprimanded the Pope in a statement saying you really hurt these, these um, victims of sexual abuse, and the Pope backtracked a little bit. Yeah, it's hard to understand why he has been such a strong supporter of Barros. Just this morning before I came in, I, I read a story in the New York Review of Books, which is a very secular, rather left-wing 
Um, good, but a good book review. I, I, I tend to read it because I want to get a sense of what is in the culture that's kind of strong. And there's a very good article by Ariel Dorfman, who is a, Ch a Chilean um, and who knows the church in Chile rather well. And he says that he believes that the Pope himself was accused wrongly, he believes, during the dirty war in Argentina. Mm. And he's been hammered by the media for that. And he thinks mm. that the left wing is... And, and, and foolish people have accepted uh, a false story about him. And so he's been inclined to think the same thing about Barros. Right. The problem is, in the Barros case, that Barros was removed, and there are living victims of this awful priest, Kazima, I think his name right. is something like, right. like that. Um, there are living victims who claim that the bishop either saw what was going on, knew what was going on, and did nothing about it. Now, if you wanted to take a kind of prudent approach to this, it seems to me you would have said, look, I find nothing wrong with this, but I will appoint Bishop Barros right. to, you know, whatever other office. Right. To force him into, into that diocese with people who were victims mm. um, reacting to this, even some of the Pope's strongest supporters have been saying they don't understand why he insisted on doing this. Yeah. And as um, Ariel Dorfman says in his article in the New York Review of Books, it was he thought uncharacteristic of the Pope that he burst out in anger at the end that this was all calumny, there was no proof. And the, the word proof was the thing that got Cardinal O'Malley moving right. because proof, evidence, testimony, yeah. I mean, these are it things... It sounds very think, litigious right. and, and removes you from right. the spiritual and moral sins also being But it's, it, it's uh, an unforced error, I would say. I, I think that yeah. there are other ways and to... The Pope, and we should say, the Pope on the plane home apologized. Yeah. He said, I used the wrong word. I shouldn't have used proof. He continued to back Barros, by the way, but then he said, I realize those words were a slap in the face to people and to the victims, but he's still backing the bishop for whatever reason. Let's talk very quickly about a story just breaking now in China, and this is really concerning. We have had Cardinal Joseph Zen on this program over many, many years about the situation of the underground church, a persecuted church faithful to Rome, They've died, they've bled, they lost, they've lost houses and social position over their faith. Now the church, a formal Vatican delegation, is asking two Chinese bishops to essentially step aside for these illicitly ordained Chinese government counterparts, the members of the Patriotic Association who are now bishops. And uh, one, one elder bishop is saying, I'm not going to resign, I'm not going to retire. The other is saying, I refuse to operate under the, the uh, in obedience to this fraudulent government chosen bishop. They don't recognize them. The Vatican seems to be trying to find some mutual recognition here between themselves and the Chinese government. Where do things stand? Well, we don't know because they haven't really revealed what, what, the, the, full under, what the underlying agreement is going to be with the Chinese government. But I've got to say I'm very disturbed, and I agree with Cardinal Zen very much. This is a heroic people yeah. who have tried to resist a communist government, which is, as we even speak, destroying churches, burning churches, right. and, and oppressing uh, Christians of all denominations, but, but uh, Catholics so, uh, right. among them. Um, the desire to get a, an agreement at all costs is a very dangerous move. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I remember Cardin when Cardinal Zen was here last spring, and I've had a long history. I, I've written a book about t t modern martyrs, yes. and I've spoken with representatives of the Chinese government here. They, the ones who, who deal with religion, I think, are the biggest liars I've met in 30 years living here mm. in Washington. They come here, and they lie to your face, and they tell you, oh, well, that was just some local official mm -hmm. that, you know, that blew up that church. And we, we don't really believe But mm -hmm. th this is a controlled society. Yeah. We, we know what they do. Cardinal Zen insist that you cannot trust a regime like this. Mm. You know, we're Americans. We are vigilant about our own American regime right. because we know human beings are fallible. They can be corrupt. Right. We've got a regime that's essentially a very clever, soft tyranny, and sometimes not so soft, yeah. that is engaging in negotiations that are they going to live up to them? The Chinese play a long game, as we often joke. They, they, right. someone, once asked, uh, uh, someone once asked Ho Chi Minh, I, I'm sorry, uh, Chairman Mao, oh. what he thought about the uh, French Revolution. He said, it's too early to tell. It's been only 200 <laughs> years. You know? um, they play a long game. So, yep. you know, if they can get Rome to kind of agree to, to, to something and then just by salami tactics mm. take over further down the line. Well, the fact that last year they were ripping down crosses from churches, knocking churches down and arresting clergy, tells me this is another piece 
of that regime trying to co-op whatever faithful remnant remains. And what Cardinal Zen is saying, and we should also report, Cardinal Zen got in line to go see the Pope today. He brought a letter to the Pope on behalf of the underground church to make him aware, I think, of their concerns. The Pope says he will read the letter. Whether that will change things, I don't know. But God bless Zen, a real heroic a hero on religious liberty, human rights, for so many years, in his 80s, taking the time to go to the Vatican and make this plea on behalf of those people. You talk about a people without voice. Those are people without voices. And um, we'll see where this goes, but I I'm deeply concerned about any kind of commingling or Vatican imprimatur upon what is a, a, a government-run version of the church, almost an upside-down church, um, and giving it giving it some kind of sanction and authority. Asia News, which is a, an official publication of the, um, of the Vatican, which is run by a very, very good priest, Bernardo Cervalera uh -huh. is his name. You probably know him. Yeah. Um, they immediately stepped out and said this is a, a bad step for us, that this is mm -hmm. going to betray people who have been heroic witnesses in our time. Yeah. And um, we talk in the United States about the necessity in our own society, which is far less repressive, to right. be heroic witnesses. If we're going to give up on people who have really been willing to go to the wall for the sake of their faith in Jesus Christ, then I don't know how we can talk to people mm. in our own society. Robert Royal, thank you as always for being here. And we will stay in touch. Uh, you can always find Robert's commentary at thecatholicthing.org.